I was lying in the bar moaning about not being able to write, <clears throat> which I do quite a lot. Except this was 15 years ago, and my girlfriend at the time, who was already very bored of me saying that kind of thing, suggested I just get into the Fiat Panda and drive as far as I could, because I've always been inspired by long car journeys and old-fashioned motorway service stations with crusty ketchup bottles and obese lorry drivers and those crimped mince pie silver foil ashtrays. Two days later, I was in Durness, which is in the northwest corner of Scotland, about as far as you can drive without sinking. These amazing white beaches like Greece and this amazing wind like Siberia. The following morning, I got a ferry across the Kyle to Cape Roth, piloted slightly erratically by this large bearded man who'd been up all night at a Cayley in Oban. Earlier this summer, I was teaching an Arvon course at Hebden Bridge. In one of the workshops, we covered a table in a huge sheet of paper, and I put a constellation of big dots all over it, labeling each one as potential turning points in the lives of the characters we were trying to write about. Birth, death, divorce, leg amputation, discovering you're adopted, coming out. Take these dots, I said, and connect them with a line, and you've got a life. Take these other dots and connect them, you've got another life. We're looking at an almost infinite number of novels sitting in front of us. But, everyone kept saying, how do we connect these dots? How do we connect the plane crash and the triplets? How do we connect the cancer and the bike accident? Don't, I said. That's the reader's job. Alex is reading a bedtime story to his children. Alex is building a bomb in the garage. We make the story when we hear it. We can't help it, because that's what human beings do. It's an 11 mile walk to the lighthouse and the whole of the Cape is an MOD bombing range. So it's completely empty of people and it's spectacularly beautiful. Kerveg Bay, the cathedral sea stacks. The lighthouse used to be connected to civilization by a single telegraph wire which ran along the road and you can still see the chopped down telegraph poles and the wire and the ceramic bushings. I stole one, obviously, because that's what you do. Rather like I stole a stone from Thoreau's cabin near Walden Pond once. I thought I'd get a poem out of it, if nothing else. If this was that kind of nature slash travel essay, I'd, I'd tell you how Robert Stevenson designed and built the lighthouse in 1828 and how the HMS Caribbean went down in 1915 en route to Scarpa Flow. And, and, and. And I wish I could write like that, but whenever I read an essay like that, my heart sinks because I simply can't do it. I know a little bit about particle physics or Virginia Woolf or the philosophy of free will. And it's great for a certain kind of upmarket dinner party, but is it really knowledge? Pliny, whose natural history was the template for pretty much everything we now call an encyclopedia, used to have a servant who traveled with him everywhere, constantly reading books out loud so that he never lost an opportunity for learning more about the world. And I think of that sometimes when I'm sitting on the sofa watching season three of Lost. <laughs> Bushings. They lie discarded in the long grass between the lighthouse and the Kyle, a yard of snipped off wire knotted round their necks. At one end, a whitewashed room, the fog of woodbines, a terrier, and the fastness of the Norwegian sea running in its mildewed frame. At the other, tanning salons, the winter of discontent, banana fritters and Saturday night fever. In between, humming in the cable, buried under gales and static, the lonely birthday greetings, requests for tunnock's tea cakes and a claw hammer, the bump and crackle of a coal fire, the lonely maydays and the silence after. Up until recently, I had a real infatuation with the work of David Foster Wallace, infinite jest, oblivion, brief interviews with hideous men, he was just cleverer than everyone else. His books were longer, stranger, more demanding. It was a kind of boy thing, really. I'm in remission now, but I still love his footnotes. Big footnotes, footnotes to footnotes, footnotes to footnotes to footnotes. Because isn't that the way the mind works? Or, or maybe it's just me. I see a tiny Cucatani figurine from 4000 BC in the Ashmolean Museum, and I read about how it's evidence of some kind of primitive magic. And I think, well, isn't it always? It certainly is for my kids, and I've got a 
little rubber cow key ring that lights up and moves when you squeeze it. And I'd be slightly uncomfortable if I lost it. And then I think about my action man in his silver firefighting suit. And then I think about Neil Armstrong in 1969. And then I think about the dark between the stars and how apparently it's full of tiny particles of soot and sand that you could collect in a jam jar. A couple of years ago, I helped out with a psychiatry experiment at the Warnford Hospital. I lay in a brain scanner while I watched a series of images flashed up on the screen in front of me. Some were meant to be neutral, some very shocking. I remember a towel thrown on a bathroom floor, which was the most beautiful shade of blue I've ever seen. I remember pictures that were meant to be pornographic, but were obviously taken from Mayfair circa 1972 and rather touching. The tennis girl half an hour later in the shower with her coach. I remember a picture of a hideously disfigured, traumatized human body, followed immediately by a picture of a tiny dessert fork, which is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I didn't realize cutlery could do that kind of damage. One of the great things about Arvon is watching a light bulb come over, up over someone's head when they realize what all writers realize eventually and then some tragically forget that it's not about you. You start off with these amazing pictures in your head and you think your job is to get them down onto paper. Then you realize the reader can't see the pictures in your head and doesn't give a damn. Are they entertained? Period. That's it. You've got to make yourself small. You've got to vanish. On my first, first Arvon course, I handed out little cards with places written on them. Laundrette, chapel, lighthouse. Then I handed out cards with rules about how we were going to write about them. Chris Thomas got bathroom and every sentence in the negative. This is the beginning of what he wrote. This was not the Hilton, I realized, as I entered through an aperture that was clearly not a door. The absence of water, the lack of taps, and a floor covering that was not waterproof were disturbing signs. That dangling object, was it a shower curtain? No. <laughs> the wallpaper, I realized on close inspection, wasn't. <laughs> Which was a light bulb moment for me as well, because we can see that room, even though he's described nothing in it. Because it's not just connections that we make automatically. Images spring to mind, almost unbidden. And I sometimes think that a writer's job is just to create the gaps that the reader can then fill. Full Moon. It's one of my favorite books. It's a collection of photographs taken on the Apollo space missions, digitally restored by Michael Light. This incredible, luminous detail. The dust on the chunky tires of the moon rover. Thomas Stafford asleep in this wonky trapezium of sunlight in the command module. This little color Polaroid of Charles Duke's family, which he took up there and left in the dust of the Descartes Highlands, which will still be there above our heads, even now. It's so clear, you think, this really happened. And then you think, this is so clear, maybe it didn't, because this could be a soundstage in Nevada. Because it wasn't like that in 1969, was it? When we were sitting in the living room in the small hours of the morning, watching Neil Armstrong do his final bouncy step down. It was the gales and the static that made it real. Play school, Z cars, football matches, everything seen through this blizzard of zigzag snow that stood between us and over the hills and far away where all the best stories came from. This from Thoreau's Walden. We need the tonic of wildness at the same time that we are earnest to explore and learn all things, we require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable. That land and sea be infinitely wild, unsurveyed and unfathomed, because unfathomable by us. We cannot have enough of nature. We need to experience our limits transgressed and some nature pasturing freely where we never wander. The Apollo 10 capsule is in fact in the Science Museum in the center of London. It's amazing, it's pure steampunk. It's all battered panels and rivets and handles, burnt and burnished like this bedpan on a pub wall, except it went to the moon, went around it and came back with Eugene Thomas and uh, Eugene Cern and Thomas Stafford, John Young on board. 
This was 1969. We didn't get pocket calculators till 1971. I still can't get my head around that amazing fact. But it happened, and it's right there, and if no one's watching, you can reach out and you can touch it. And it has that same radiant presence I'm always looking for in stuff. The blue towel, the Cucutaney figurine, the bushing, the bump and crackle of a coal fire. The poet Don Patterson once said that art's job is to introduce a little more chaos into the world. Though I guess on an average morning he's probably trying to wrestle a little order out of the chaos like most writers are doing on an average morning. What he means by chaos, I think, is not smashing things, but smashing the connections that we habitually make between things. If you go out into your garden tonight after midnight and there are no clouds, you'll look up and you'll see Orion, Beetlejuice, Regal, Bellatrix, Mintaka, and four, maybe six other stars, depending on whether you're in the counting the sword and the head camp or not. If you looked at it through an infrared telescope, you'd see something different. The sword becomes this great double splash of flame, and the head becomes a great tail of fire with a single burning eye in the middle. And what we call Orion isn't really there at all, because we're not looking at the light anymore. We're looking at the heat. We're looking at the soot and the sand, because they're warm, and they swirl and clump and gather in these huge dark nebulae, which are completely invisible to us. Perseus, Scorpio, Pegasus, we look up into the sky, we always see the same characters telling the same stories, but there are an infinite number of ways of connecting the same dots. There's an infinite number of stories there waiting to be told. I think of Louis McNeese's famous poem, Snow. Suddenly the room was rich, and the great bay window was spawning snow, and the pink roses against it, soundlessly collateral and incompatible. The way he doesn't draw any conclusions, the way he just lays one thing beside another, the snow, the glass, the roses, the way he just celebrates what he calls the drunkenness of things being various. I went into my son's school recently to take his class for a short creative writing workshop. These were kids of eight and nine. I handed round postcards with photographs on the front, which we were going to use as inspirations for each of our stories. We talked about what we liked about stories, what we hated, what worked, what didn't. And I said how all stories began with a problem that needed solving. They wrote for 10, 15 minutes. I told them to put their pens down. And then I told them to turn the postcard face down on the desk so we couldn't see the picture so that we wouldn't judge what they'd written according to how well it described the picture, but according to whether it moved us here. One little boy's story started, she was the last woman in the universe and she fell in love with a peanut. <laughs> One girl's story started, they were sitting on the edge of the world, the baby was dead. Thank you.